Hello class, this is Mr. Hart, and in this video we want to talk about how to think like a computer and how computers are built in general. This is exploring computer science and it's really hard to understand how a computer works and work with a computer to do important things if you don't know how it's built and how it functions underneath all the technical stuff, right? You need to know what's inside the case of your computer to understand how it thinks the way it does. Okay. So the question we're going to answer today is how do you build a computer from scratch, right? We use them all the time, probably every day, and a lot of people don't know what components make computers, okay? So to help us think about how to build a computer, instead of just telling you all the pieces, um, I want you to have some intuition about why things are put in computers the way they are. And so we're going to learn many parts of computer and I think the easiest way to do this is to think of it like you're building a person okay and that sounds kind of weird but we're you know we're gonna assemble the heart and the brains and all the different parts of the human body that you would need and need to function <clears throat> and we'll find their connected pieces for computers okay so uh, let's just get into it I think this will start to make more sense um, so to start um, just like with any person, I think the first thing you really need is some way for that person to think, right? And we know for a human, that's the brain, but for a computer, in order for it to think at all, to do anything really, the most important piece of the computer is the CPU, okay? Now, the CPU is the central processing unit. That's what it, its actual name is. And you can think of it as the brains of the computer. It, basically is built just to crunch numbers as fast as possible. It gets instructions from other parts of the computer and its job is just to compute those instructions as quickly as possible. Okay, so when you buy a computer, you'll see this often listed. The better the CPU, generally the better the computer overall. Um, so there's two big brands. Um, there's the AMD line of processors. They're really easy to identify because they all just start with the letter A pretty much. Um, and then there's the Intel line. So you have the Celeron and the Pentium processors. <coughs> you probably have heard of the i3 and i5 and i7. Those are their higher end processors. They're starting to get i9s, um, which are even better. So when you look at a computer, um, you can look and see which of these processors is listed. And I'll give you a general idea of how fast it is. And I've listed them here in an order of slowest to fastest. So like an AMD A4 and an Intel Celeron, those are both really slow. So if you get a computer with that, you can expect your computer to be pretty slow. Um, but as you go up these, um, computers get better and better and better. Okay, um, I've had a computer with an A10, and it was awesome, super fast, it was great. Um, and anything above an i3 and an i5 is usually going to be uh, plenty of computing power uh, for most applications. Okay, so basically think about how big the brain is, is based on the CPU, and that will determine how fast it can crunch numbers. And a lot of CPUs these days have multiple cores, meaning that they basically have multiple CPUs attached to one part. And so it's like having multiple brains. They can do many things in parallel. So most processors are at least dual core, meaning they have two. A lot of processors have four cores, okay, quad core processors. And even cell phones and other things up to, at this point are starting to get up to six or eight processors. I've even see as, seen as high as 12 which means it can have 12 brains essentially going at the same time, which is pretty cool. Okay, so I don't have a, a CPU with me, but it's a little tiny chip that looks like this. Okay, and so when we're with our person that we're building, so far we have the brain. Okay, <clears throat> but that's not very good by itself, right? We need to be able to talk to other parts of the body. Okay, if the brain's not connected to anything, then it's not really useful. It needs to be able to communicate with other pieces. Okay, so on a human, that's more of like the nerves and the muscle structure, etc. Um, but on a, a computer, that's the same as the motherboard. Okay, so the motherboard, you can think of like the nervous system and the veins and all the different parts that go through your body that allow your body to function with other parts of your body. Okay. And the motherboard is that for the computer. It allows the CPU to give and receive instructions from other parts of the computer. 
and not only CPU, basically everything in the computer goes through the motherboard. If any other piece needs to talk to another piece, it's talking through the motherboard. Okay. Um, you won't usually see the motherboard advertised um, when you're buying a computer, um, but generally it's just picked to be compatible with the CPU. Well, the CPUs prefer a kind of motherboard. Um, and so you, you generally don't buy this unless you're building your own computer. You don't pick this out specifically, but you're, the person that manufactures the computer always makes sure this is compatible with the other pieces, especially the CPU. Okay, so we're getting a little bit better. We have our brain and we have our nervous system coming down. And on our computer, we have the CPU and the motherboard. Now, obviously we want to attach these. So I actually have right here, let me pull this out, okay. I actually have a motherboard, okay? And usually they're green, this one happens to be tan, but um, I've seen all sorts of colors, red, blue, it doesn't really matter. It's a silicon board, and you can see there's all sorts of connections in there, okay? And so the biggest slot on the motherboard though, that's easy to see, is actually the CPU slot right here, okay? So when we put our computer together, that's where this ends up going, is right in that slot right here okay that's the most ide easily identical part of the motherboard is a spot for the CPU and then they often come with a big fan okay that you can put on top of that to keep it cool so you would just attach that and so a lot of motherboards look like this if you see a giant fan protruding from the motherboard it's probably the spot where the CPU was or is currently okay to keep it cool so that's the first part of building a computer. All right, so things are looking good, but a brain with some nervous system sticking out of it is still um, not the best, right? We still have things, and brains actually can't power themselves, right? Your body doesn't run from your brain. On a human body, it runs from your heart, right? The blood running through your body is pretty much the most important system. Okay, so likewise, a computer would be completely useless if it didn't have a power supply. Okay, so the power supply gives the computer the energy it needs to keep running, um, similar to how your heart pumps blood to the rest of the body. So the power supply connects to all different parts of the motherboard to make sure power flows through the system properly. And it makes sure it converts electricity in certain ways to the things it needs to, etc. cetera. Um, so if you look at an actual computer, the, the power supply, if it's a desktop computer tower, it's generally in the back on the top, sometimes on the bottom. Um, if it's on a laptop, it's usually in the cord itself. Okay, so on a lot of laptop cords, you'll see a big block, big, big black block, block on it, or you'll see it um, like on a Mac that's usually on the part that plugs into the wall. There's a big brick that you plug into the wall, big white brick. Whatever that brick is, wherever it is at on the cord, that's your power supply cord. Okay, it does a lot of things. It converts the electricity to the right voltage, etc. cetera. Um, converts it from AC to DC. But that cord is vital for the rest of the computer to run. Now, a lot of laptops have uh, a battery as a backup, and obviously you want to be able to run off your battery. <clears throat> but that battery would not have charged properly if it didn't have the right power supply. Okay. So, Going back to our computer, again, on most desktops, it's kind of this big blocky area in the top where you plug in the actual power cord. And that block, let me actually pull one out. Okay. This is actually a, a disk drive, but it looks about this big. Okay. You'll see these big blocks and they're just in the back of the computer at the top usually. Okay. So again, they look like this. Um, on laptops, it's usually the cord that you actually plug in the wall that has all the necessary pieces. Okay, so so far we got our brain, our nervous system, and veins, and our heart. Okay, and likewise on our computer, we got our CPU, our motherboard, and our power supply. So at this point, your computer could run. It would be running, but it wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> it wouldn't have anything to control. Okay, so your computer is actually functional at this point, but it doesn't have any way to communicate with the outside world, okay? So this is where input and output devices um, come in handy, okay? So 
Um, an input device is anything that allows a computer, computer to receive information from the outside world. Okay, so this could be your mouse, could be the keyboard, could be a microphone, a camera, etc. Anything that is going into the computer to be worked on is an input. Okay, usually we use our mouse and keyboard to um, input information to the computer. It could be a touch screen or something like that as well. Okay, and then the output devices are anything that allow the computer to put information back out into the world. Okay, so <clears throat> back in the day, that was through a lot of printed stuff. Okay, especially older computers, they didn't have really have monitors, so they just would print things on punch cards and other things like that. Okay, and then on a, a fax paper, essentially. Okay, that could be your speakers for sound, but nowadays the most important one is actually the monitor for the visuals. Okay, and thank heavens, working on computers with a monitor is much easier than it used to be when you didn't have monitors back in the day. Okay, and so these input and outputs are basically how you tell the computer to do something and it lets you know that it did it and processed it, etc. Okay, so going back to our representation, on a person, that would be, you know, your eyes, your ears, your mouth, right? All the different things you use to sense the world around you, right? That's your input and output device. But on a computer, right? It's our monitor, our keyboard, our mouse, etc. Okay? <clears throat> so, so far our person's looking pretty good. Um, but being just a jumble of parts is not the best thing for a person and likewise not the best thing for a computer. Um, so, Again, at this point, your computer really is functional. You could use it as a, a working computer and run programs, etc. cetera. Um, but it's starting to be really messy. So usually you want some kind of computer case, okay? And so the computer case, <clears throat> excuse me, is the outside shell that kind of holds all the pieces in the right spots, okay? That's why your computer comes with a desktop tower if you buy a desktop or you have your laptop actually has the body on the bottom they don't just give you a collection of parts in their arms and then you know plop it on the table etc right <laughs> you want to organize it in some fashion okay so likewise with our person right we're going to put it together as a person and put all the parts in the right spot on our computer we're going to use this casing for the tower right and put the appropriate things inside keep in mind we want to leave the input and outputs on the outside of the computer, right? So the motherboard and the power supply and all that stuff's gonna go in the computer case. And then the keyboard, mouse, and monitor are gonna stay out. Just like on a person, you'd want your eyes and your ears and your mouth to be on the outside so you can actually input and output stuff, okay? All right, and now we're starting to look like our regular computer that you use every day, okay? So, done, right? Terrific, we built a computer. But not quite. We have one more step that we need to think about, and that is memory. Okay, so we talked about the brain, and the brain on a human has the function of doing both the calculations, right? You you see something, you want to do something, right? Your brain is responsible for telling the rest of the body how to do it, right? You want to play basketball, it tells your body how to dribble, etc. But the brain also is in charge of remembering things, remembering things from the past, and remembering how to do things you've done before, etc. On a computer, your your CPU can't do that. So it has to have a separate part for memory. So we kind of have to split the brain into two parts. So on a computer, the memory is not handled by the CPU <clears throat> because as it says, CPUs actually can't remember anything. Okay, so we need something to load and save files and information. There's two ways to do that. The first is through random access memory. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. The first is through random access memory. And it is the short term memory that just remembers what's going on on your computer right now. Okay? Um, so, for example, if you have a lot of tabs open on Google Chrome, it remembers what you have on each tab. So you can quickly go back and forth between them. It doesn't have to reload an entire website or entire file every time you go back. It's just stored in RAM. Okay? It's stored in the random access memory. So it remembers everything on your screen and everything you're running right now as the computer's on at this moment. But as soon as you turn the computer off, the RAM disappears, okay? It forgets everything you were doing and then the next time you turn on your computer, it remembers what's going on currently 
with it on and then it disappears, etc. right? So um, it only remembers the current state of the machine, okay? That's why you also need the hard drive, which is the long-term memory, okay? This is all the programs on your computer, all the photos and other things you view on your computer that you need to store. Um, anything you want to open up again after you've turned off your computer, that is stored on the hard drive, okay? Including the operating system that runs the whole machine. So if you run Windows or you run um, Mac, right? They both have to store all the files that run the um, software somewhere and that is on this hard drive, okay? So you wanna make sure you have a good hard drive, okay? And so let's take a look at these two. So when you go and buy a computer or you're building a computer, you generally want lots of RAM, okay? In most cases, the, uh, the RAM these days is around four to eight gigabytes. Sorry, my uh, camera's focusing. Um, it's around four to eight gigabytes for a computer. I recommend going eight gigabytes if you can, or maybe even 16 gigabytes for a higher end computer, because RAM's really important if you wanna do a lot of things, okay? On most phones, it's one gigabyte to four gigabytes, okay? And that number is going up and up every day for a lot of phones, okay? Um, and I have some RAM here, okay? It is just one of these little sticks, okay? It's not too big. And if you look on the motherboard, you'll see these slots right here, okay? Those are where the RAM usually goes, okay? Um, or actually, sorry, it's these blue slots on this part, okay? Um, but either way, it looks kind of the same. And you would just slide those sticks of RAM into those slots. This one's not quite the right length, but the RAM goes like that and kind of sticks out, okay? So when you're building a computer, you want plenty of RAM. Usually two four gigabyte sticks is plenty, okay? And you would just put that right there. And then um, just a side note, you want to offset. So one stick would be there and the next stick would actually be two lines over on the next blue one, okay? Little side note if you ever wanna build an actual computer where you put the RAM support, okay? But that's what those slots are for on a motherboard, okay? So that's the RAM. Obviously on a phone it's much smaller because you want your phone to fit in your pocket, not be a giant stick, okay? Which is why there's a little bit less memory on um, a phone for RAM, okay? And then there's the actual hard drive, okay? For most computers, it's 256 gigabytes to a terabyte. Um, again, depending on which one you buy. And then for most phones these days, it's about 16 gigabytes to 128 gigabytes, depending on the phone or the tablet. Obviously, the more the hard drive space, the better overall because you can store more photos. But there is one distinction to make. <clears throat> well, in the old days, we used to always buy hard drives that look like this, like you see, okay? And these are pretty big. These are called um, optical disk drives. It actually has a physical needle that spins around inside of there and reads a big disk. And so these are great because they can store a lot of memory. You know, your one terabyte drives are usually on bricks like this, but you can actually get faster um, hard drives on what's called a solid state drive. And it runs like the same way that RAM runs. Um, instead of being a big disk, it's a silicon wafer, okay? And it can run a lot faster, but generally it stores less. So be careful when you're looking for hard drives just because it stores less may not necessarily mean it's a worse hard drive. It may actually be faster, just not have as much memory. So I actually recommend for most people getting a 256 gigabyte solid state rather than a one terabyte optical disk, okay? So again, just something to keep in mind when you buy a computer or you build one, okay? If you ever choose to build one. All right, but that is now actually everything we need, okay? And the thing I wanna keep in mind is that I keep saying computer like we're building this big desktop tower, which definitely the pieces I showed you, that's what it's for. But you could do this for any computing device. Every computer has to follow these steps in some way. Obviously, laptops and desktop towers have to do this for sure. But your phone and even like a tablet or an Alexa, those things have to follow it too. 
your phone obviously has smaller components, so its CPU is smaller and its RAM stick is smaller and its motherboard is smaller, but it still needs all those pieces or it can't run, okay? It needs all the different parts to run a computation properly. And so we manipulate in different ways depending on the device we're using, but we still need that. Even your Amazon um, Echo or Alexa or whatever, right? It may not need a really big hard drive because it's not storing a ton of stuff. It's just connecting to a network, right? But still needs a CPU to process what you're saying and to run stuff. It still needs RAM to know what song it's currently playing or what you're looking up or what news file it's playing, etc. So they all need these pieces if it's going to be any type of computing machine. Okay. All right. And then last of all, uh, make sure you also understand that there's other pieces you can add. We looked at all the very basics, but nowadays a network card and a Bluetooth card are pretty much essential. Everyone's connecting to Wi-Fi and their Bluetooth headphones, etc. So most machines have these in them as well. And again, on the motherboard, the ones I first pointed to down here, those are where the network cards and the Bluetooth cards would go in, is these extra slots. And then um, if you're doing a lot of high-end gaming or video processing, etc., a lot of computers will have graphic cards, separate graphic cards you install. Um, and then even depending on the device, you may have more of a writing tablet setup. So it has a touch screen or a tablet that you can um, plug in and use. Or like on iPad, there's the Apple Pencil. So a lot of computers nowadays are starting to use more of a writing system that you can uh, input. Okay. So there's a lot of things you can add, but the things we talked about were the, are the most fundamental pieces that every computing machine needs. Okay. All right. So... Um, really quickly, just let me introduce the activity you're going to do for your homework. Basically, you're going to look at some computer specs and compare them side by side and say, well, which pieces are better overall in different circumstances? So look at two computers and say, well, this one has a better CPU and this one has more RAM, etc. So this one would probably be better at this activity, etc. So look at Canvas. Um, you'll see the details of how you're going to do that. But the key is to learn what you, take what you learned from today and use that and apply it to actually buying a computer and saying which pieces are better and what, would, what does that mean for the specific computer setup that I'm looking at. Okay? All right. Well, thank you for watching, and I'll talk to you later.